Hi guys, I'm with my buddy Jane Kelly that I love dearly and she owns On The Wing. She's a wildlife rehabilitator, specifically raptors and vultures, but she's an avid animal lover. Check her out on Instagram. Uh, there's so much cool stuff you can learn and we're going to do a story uh, talking about one of the big problems here and everywhere and that's rodenticide and what it's doing to our wildlife. But if you want to see cute birds and rehabilitation, yeah, if you want to see cute little solid owls and barred owls and all sorts of cool stuff, follow Jane. Uh, Jane certainly needs the support, and she's an awesome educator. And I mean it. She's very progressive, and she's teaching people things that most people don't even know. Hi. See how it reacts to the infrared from your camera? Yeah. You think so? Me, uh, it just yeah. reacted immediately as soon as you aimed it right at it, just like I do. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Whenever I put my phone on and try to videotape yeah, something, yeah, well, so many reptiles. The do they do the same thing? Yeah. Oh, my freak out. Duck. You can get an animal totally fine, and as soon as you do it, like a monitor or snakes, they like start freaking yeah, out. Yeah, so are they both females? Yeah. Nice. Aren't they pretty? What kind of owls? Are they? These are barred owls. B a r r e d. Okay. We're still working with the ball is red with him and What do you this, mean? Oh, Mark. Will you help him see? <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. I love it. What are we doing right now, Kevin? I'm playing with turkey vultures. <laughs> and it? I'm at my buddy Jane's, Jane Kelly on the wing. Peace. And Jane is very progressive minded when it comes to animals and she also has a bleeding heart just like me. So I'm here to talk about something that's been really bothering me for a long time, and it's bothering Jane. And I'm gonna sit here and play, I know. So all of the uh, vultures here, are they all, they're all rescues? They are rescues, yep. They were imprinted uh, from other facilities and ended up here. And I'm just playing with them because I love them. I'm very much into raptors and stuff like that, so Kevin, these are wonderful. you everything. I mean, right? that's, that's Kevin true. loves every kind of animal. Yeah. I, I'm a chicken though when well, it comes to reptiles. Yeah, but what's so wonderful about Jane that I love so much, Jane is so <laughs> progressive minded and uh, she sees things that other people don't see. And I think maybe some of I might see things that other people don't see. But so we um, would be special. We, we're very special. We, <laughs> super, super special. First but right here, these are turkey vultures and these are actually been imprinted on people. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to be used, uh, Jane uses stuff is uh, education animals and they're they're basically uh, the spokes birds for all sorts of other birds that she Look at Josie, honey, that's perfect. Yeah. Oh, so. that says a lot about you, Kevin. Oh you, you know I just that I does. speak I speak animal. And I think she actually likes me. That's a beautiful bird. This Aren't they cool? Yes. Wonderful. So we're training these guys right now uh, to they'll be flighted. We'll fly them and um, we're gonna actually teach them how to race. Because uh, they're really fast on foot, and we're going to line people up and wow. see who can outrun a vulture. Really? Yeah, good luck. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I'll run to the vulture. I won't run away from the vulture. So wonderful. And these are the, the birds that you will see along the, the highways, and you'll see them you know, flying around, floating around. But to actually see a turkey vulture or a black vulture in person really is a, it's a whole different thing because. People usually don't get to get close to these animals. And they're super intelligent, and Jane was just telling us how long-lived they are, too. They're misunderstood. Like, people think they're gross, and, <laughs> um, and actually they prevent us from getting disease. One thing that these guys are susceptible to is lead poisoning. So when hunters leave their um, carcass uh, after they've taken the meat, um, these guys feed on that, and they, so they come in with lead poison. Oh. Yeah. So one thing I noticed with these guys, when you actually, I've met these guys a couple times, if you go in and you show like weakness oh, yeah. or anything like that, or you show a lot of worry, yeah. you're, they're more going to try to take advantage of like, you know, maybe pecking at you better. So if I go right in there and I just act totally indifferent to what they can do to you, they end up being very gentle. And if I start acting scared, I think... Yeah, I think they, they, they can that's a great, up, huh? great observation. Uh, I have a volunteer who's petrified of coming in here and they have a hierarchy, right? So, yeah. and you'll see them when they're eating, they'll, they'll grab each other's tails and yank. And so I was showing her that you have to come in and just 
grab them by the tail, grab them over the wings, and let them know that you're your top of the tier. Oh, um, I think I have a crush on this one. I know. Yeah, I think she nice. has a crush on you too. <laughs> yeah, that's it. What? Yeah, what's what's that all about? Isn't that cool? So when they have their head in 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 oh. deep in a carcass. Um, their breathe. nares start to run, they secrete um, fluid, and yeah. so nothing gets lodged in there, preventing them from getting bacteria lodged in there and then getting um, an infection. Wow. Tell us how remarkable their olfactory system is. Yeah, so they can smell like a mile away a carcass uh, that is rotting. rotting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And black vultures. That's why she likes me. Because you're rotting I'm carcass. rotting, I'm rotting See, he's a rotting carcass. And black vultures, which we're starting to see around here, they do not have such a great sense of smell as turkey vultures. They actually have a better sense of sight. And so they follow the turkey vultures, and they're more aggressive than our turkey vultures. And smaller. And as soon as the turkey vultures find a carcass and they land on it, the black vultures come in and push off the turkey vultures. Nope. Oh, it's a good shot. Nice. Got him. No, no. Nice. Jane's like lifting weights. Yeah, right? right? <laughs> She's Do your rest, Jane. Oh, do that again, do that again, Jane. Nice. <laughs> nice. Can you show your wings? The girl Got it. Wings. There you go. You see that white underneath there? So a lot of people think that these guys are eagles, but they have a just a slight V when they're flying, and eagles fly very flat. This is Musetta. She's a red-tailed hawk, female. She's a, a second-year bird, came in as a West Nile case, and uh, we gave her supportive care and anti-inflammatory meds. And uh, I flew her for a season for falconry, and now we'll re we'll, we will release her in the next couple weeks. So you just fixed her up and borrowed her from nature, and now you're going to put her back. Yeah, I wanted to make yeah. sure she could successfully awesome. hunt. Yeah. Um, instead of throwing her back out there, and, you know, the, usually their eyesight is impaired from West Nile, um, and and she can hunt just fine. Yeah, the virus is here. It's been here since the 50s. And okay. some birds are more susceptible than others. Like crows are very susceptible to West Nile. So are red-tailed hawks, broadwing hawks. Um, so it usually affects their coordination in their oh, eyesight. Okay. Um, and, it, you know, it can affect a lot of things, but their other organs. Transmission, mosquitoes? Is that one of those? And probably ticks. I think any yeah. sort of insect that can bite. Uh, blood, blood sucking. Yes. So, and yeah. they get inoculated. Yes. So, but birds are pretty apt to clean and keeping themselves clean, right? With yeah, so these guys don't preen themselves like yeah. like a songbird or okay. a parrot. Dude, you don't know what a flat fly is. Yeah, these it's, guys usually have oh flat flies. Oh my god, dude. Okay. You've never, Educate me, what is it? You've what never is? seen... They, no. So they're, they're really creepy. They they're flat the and, they, um, and they move in and out of the feathers. So it looks almost like the markings on her feathers. You, you're like, did I see something? Or was that her feather moving? And oh, then yeah. these, these flat flies move in and out. And wild birds usually have a lot of them, especially when they've been on the ground. Um, but thankfully, our birds are healthy, so they don't have them. But when you find a bird infested with flat fly, and you're trying to squish them, and you're like, oh, what is this? And of course, you start itching. Yeah, but yeah. it kind of freaks you out, because it's, yeah. it's a super bug. It looks it must look and, alien. And they, and they it suck does. blood, and yeah. it's just they move oh. sideways. No and, shit. Oh, yeah, they're, they're so creepy. I don't know. I counted from Worcester, from my place to Worcester and back yesterday. I'm going to show you something. So yesterday I counted on the highway, just on the fast lane on the shoulder of the road, down to Worcester and back, 15 dead. What? Red tail hawks. There might be some broad wings in there. But uh, 15, dude, I, 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 if you don't know what you're looking for, you That's don't see them. So but I see all the really? birds. I saw one live red tail hawk. I saw one flying and 15. I counted 15 dead ones because there's no more fields. The fields in so many of these places yeah, have all been developed. Yeah. The birds need these open landscapes to yeah. hunt. Uh -huh. The rodents. So what they do is they fixate. They fix on fixate on the rodent, and then they just come in there. They got tunnel vision, and they don't realize. They don't, wow. It's so sad. So we have Floki, our snowy owl, and he actually. So the bummer about snowy owls is they spin. Uh, and you'll see that he's twisted all of his dresses. So they just rotate. Same with falcons. They fly the same way. Um, 
he is, uh, I imported him from Canada. I got him as a youngster, and uh, he's an education ambassador. So he was captive bred. He's wow. non-releasable. <laughs> this is a prime example of what the disposition of a snowy owl is, and this is one that's been around humans since he was born. Um, they're very, very high-strung birds, mm -hmm. and um, people at the coast that are chasing them around and, you know, taking pictures of them all day, every day, is <clears throat> it's exhausting on them. It's stressful for them. And people say they don't look like they're stressed out. No, they've got a great poker face. However, they're burning through calories, being stressed out, trying to figure out their exit strategy. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, they could just fly away and go into the trees, but they're a wide open space bird. They, they're not equipped to be in the woods. Their, their feathers, their wings are yeah, more yeah. rigid. Yeah. Um, even if you were to touch their head feathers, yeah. it, it's so dense compared to other owls. So if we equate this to a lot of our reptiles, this, this animal is highly reactive. So they immediately go from the thinking mode into an immediate reactive defensive mm -hmm. mode where yes. they try to fly off. She's holding the animals tight on her glove with the jesses because the less you know floundering around, the, the better it is for the animal and it allows the animal to situate itself and actually think. Um, and we just recently had a snowy owl. We had two this year. Both had secondary rodenticides. Both were, be, were able to be released, which was great. Um, but they're along the coast, and there's so many bait boxes there. Um, What's secondary with that decide? That rat poison. So yeah. target, you know, they, they claim they only have a primary target, but they actually have a secondary target. And so these guys, I was just reading a study on barn owls. It only takes three toxic rodents, and they start to die after that third meal. Um, so these guys are eating those Norway rats down at the coast, and um, yeah, were they loaded with toxins? No, there's big Not boxes toxins. everywhere. Oh, poison. They're, they're poison. poison. Yes, yeah. yeah. And why did they go through those rodents in particular? Well, you know, they're 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 those those Norway rats are in in long water, um, and along the coast there's a ton of rats down there. When where you find people, you'll find rodents, and where you find rodents, you'll find raptors. Mm -hmm. So it's all connected. So if we take a, a rat, a mouse, a squirrel, uh, a vole, flying squirrels, anything like that, and we uh, we knock them up with rodenticide, yeah. they will come out into the daylight, they'll start w staggering around as they're dying. That makes a perfect target for an animal like this that's always in search of the next you know food item. So they're very, very easy to, to find. So Norway rats, which are, you know, they're going to skulk along things and they're going to try to hide a lot of times. Once they get poisoned, they act very aberrant and they make themselves very vulnerable and these guys are going to pay the price. Another thing people don't realize, airports. Guess what is happening at airports? Yeah. Big giant planes do not want to suck in birds into their engines and they do not want to collide. So in all these <laughs> giant airports, there's actually... Um, there's some really sad things going on, targeting things like geese, pigeons, and raptors. In many cases, these guys are actually shot and taken out. And there's people that will spend all their day targeting birds on the runways to make sure that there's no uh, human bird conflict. And these are always losing. And people don't realize this, but the amount of animals that are actually being lost just because of our need to fly and situate ourselves in our you know modern lifestyle these animals are just being they're being taken from the landscape and people don't know it and it's very sad for people like Jane and myself because we actually know these things going on and it's killing us what's really great about the state of New Hampshire is that they are not euthanizing our birds they actually have a great wildlife management program that they are working with us on and um, you mean at the airports at the airports, yes. All right, because that we're we're actually I mean I'm a New Hampshire guy, so uh, we're we're lucky that our fish and game and our federal fish US, and wildlife, yeah, USDA. US fish and wildlife, and USDA too. Yeah, USDA. Right. Yep. We have a barred owl here that uh, was hit by a car, and when she came in, her beak was completely shattered, um, to the point that I actually had to leave the room. I, it was very disturbing. And I called uh, a nurse who's a, um, a delivery nurse, and she came over and she put it back together like a little puzzle. And with um, a rich diet of quail and chick and uh, rabbit, 
Also, Squirrel, uh, her beak is growing at a fast rate, and she'll be releasable probably midsummer is our goal. Um, we're going to start sh um, shaping and coping her beak um, and trying to get it to grow in the right direction so that her bite is on, you know, it's correctly set. Um, yeah, so she's doing really well. So, did you hear hissing like a dragon? Yeah. Why is it doing that? It's a defense mechanism. She's so hissing like a dragon. They, yeah. What they do is they'll clack, which I think they clack for a couple of reasons. They clack, it's a warning. It's also communicating to another owl. But um, it's also pulling in scent, and you'll see them swallow as they're pulling. They're moving that air in, and they're they're tasting. They're smelling us do they through have their mouth. They don't have a Jacobson organ, but they do have a slit in the roof of their mouth, and it's okay. all connected up through their yeah, sinus cavity. Right. This is a great horned owl. It's a female, and if you look right above the center of her beak, mm -hmm. where her feathers come down, it forms like a little W. Do you see that notch? Oh yeah, look at that. So a What's little W for female, right above her, <laughs> no her beak, right in the, like see these two C's that go like this on either side yeah. of her face. Yeah. That's another way of um, identifying a female. But in the middle, when her beak is closed and the feathers come together, you'll see a, a little a little W. So they clack, they hiss, then they lunge and grab. <laughs> and they can crush up to 500 pounds per square inch with their feet. They'll predate on skunks. Yeah, their favorite thing to hunt is skunks. So 90% really? of the time when we get a wild great horned owl in, they smell a skunk. So they help control our skunk populations. Um, so those ear tufts, when they're up, uh, what's fascinating is you look at that black line, yes. and it goes all the way to the top of her eye, and when she closes her eye, that black line goes across her eye, her eyelid. So when her eyelids are closed, it looks like, open. It looks like an eye. Yeah. To another oh bird. Oh my God, it does. You see right? that? Right? Because that black is white and yeah. then the uh, like color around this looks yeah. like eyeballs. Um, <laughs> and good. then a field marking is these ear tufts when they're down yeah. from above another aerial predator, the stronger the markings, it'll look like a face. So this will look like eyes and then the nap of her neck where the feathers break, right. um, it looks like a mouth. And uh, uh, every single animal, even our domesticated cats and dogs, have field markings. So the stronger the marking, you know, the higher chance of survival. There you go, girl. She's gorgeous. So we have Leela, our Eurasian eagle owl. She is native to Russia, Siberia, and Russia, Siberia, and Asia. Um, she was born in captivity. She's a non-native species, obviously, to the U.S., and she is a relative to our great horned owl. Um, now, in her natural habitat, a bird like this in the wild would take down a small coyote, small mule deer, uh, badger, wolverines. <laughs> They're, why are you laughing? It's 10 pounds, and it, it can, can just take down. It, yeah, well, because it's it just so crazy. It, it, yeah. I mean, I've seen the golden eagles taking down the coyotes mountain goats. and all. Yeah. And they tip, they hit the mountain goats like and they, they roll it down. off. Oh, yeah. 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 God, nature is just ridiculous. It's pretty fascinating. So, Jane, tell us about the claws and actually when when they're relaxed, what Hang position they are, and once. So, is. owls have um, zygodactyl feet, and meaning that they have an opposable toe. And their outside toe has the ability to move forward or backward. So two forward, two back when they're approaching prey and grabbing and they're extending their legs out. Now their feet are wide open, right? And as they come up on the prey and their legs fold back, their feet have a ratcheting mechanism so those tendons start to grab and then it, it locks. So they don't have the ability to tell their mind, oh, I need to let go. The more something moves, the more something breathes, the more they squeeze. Um, and they're very, very powerful tools. They have razor sharp edges on the sides of the talons and then these pointed. They're very, very pointed. So when they grab, they puncture, they curl, and they rip. Um, and then their beak, they use their beak as a tool as well. Um, they'll pull stuff apart with that hooked beak. That's a wrap. Can I answer your question? So when all the way out open and then as they pull, it starts to shut. Yes. Open with yep. legs extended, and then as they pull it back in, 
the feet closed. I think a lot of people don't realize that, so uh, I always thought that was interesting. Basically, you're not getting away. You can't get away. You have to jump. If they have a hold of you, you literally have to jump, and they lose their balance, and they'll let go. We love you. Show them your wingspan. Show them your wings. Show them your wings. Oh, I gotta get that. Show them your wings. Good girl. Show them your wings. Look at that wingspan. Good girl. Did you get it? Oh yeah. Show them your wings. Good girl. Good girl. She weighs way more than my vultures do. <laughs> now, a nesting pair of barn owls. Uh, how many do you think? On Statistically, average, how many do they? Yeah, how many do they eat? How many That's rodents? What do you think? So per, per day? Per, per year? Per, per, year. Uh, per Let's say a season. Like, you know, a nesting season. 3,600. Okay. So, one, one owl eats a thousand. And you, typically, a nest is five. And now you've got the male and the female. So you've got seven owls actually doing natural pest control in this area. For what? Grand total of, of how many? 7,000 mice in a nesting season. I, that that's a lot of rodents, right? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah and no. it's very effective rodent control too. It's obviously it doesn't come with any consequence. Right. So, um, and probably even when they poop, that fertilizer is going into the ground and helping our ground, whereas um, rodenticides going into the ground are hurting our soil. Right. So, um, we we just need to get rid of rodenticides like we did DDT. That's a, actually a really good comparison. So Jane and I discussed rodenticide poisoning and, and all the hardships associated with it. And it's, it's actually getting to the point where, like, years ago we thought DDT was acceptable practices. And what that did was catastrophic for, you know, populations of birds, even, you know, peregrine falcons, bald eagles, thinning of the uh, eggshell and the poisoning and, and all that stuff. But now we're dealing with rodenticide. And it's almost in its infancy of what we actually understand about rodenticide. Besides the take of the animals suffering and, and dying horrific deaths, it's getting into the insects, it's getting into the songbirds, and it has an accumulative effect. But uh, more importantly, if you have birds that are here and there eating, ingesting something that is rodenticide poisoning in it, and low levels of rodenticide, what effect does that actually have on the long-term survivorship of that animal? Secondly, the physiological, like what's, what's the detriment to its kidneys, to its liver, what's, uh, the, has it ruined its ability to breed, all these different things. We don't even know this right. stuff, and we're just learning about that right now. And Tufts University, Maureen McMurray, I've been reading some of her stuff, and it's, uh, it's horrific. It's like the more you look, the worse mm -hmm. it looks. It's everywhere. So, yes. but, okay, one thing he's probably talking about. So if I'm a, a female and I have my eggs inside and I'm building the egg, yes. of course that's going to, that's part of your anatomy and it's going to all yeah, pass into an, an embryo so, and all that. And we don't even know, does that so create all, deformities? They, yeah, they is it know, yeah. the survivorship of that egg? We don't know any we of that. We don't know the life expectancy of the bird as well, right? right. So, that so my, my friend James in Massachusetts, he was uh, studying or he was watching, you know, he's an avid birder, and there's so many, you know, birders, and, and the, the expertise from being offered from birders, and, you know, their field notes is, is excellent. And he was watching uh, some bald eagles, and ultimately there was, uh, he watched this one pair of bald eagles that successfully had two chicks from the previous year, and then the following year they had chicks, and they noticed the female bald eagle was sitting on her nest, her wings were up, and she stayed like that for like a day, and then the next day, she was still doing it with no movement. So they, they called uh, Fish and Game, Mass Fish and Game. And they went up there, and she was dead. And her baby's ultimately dead. And, and it's all from rodenticide. And they went and test her tissue, and it came back positive for rodenticide poisoning. This is happening everywhere. There's yeah. thousands of animals that are being taken from the landscape. And the thing is, we can't quantify it because we don't see it. I told you I saw 15 dead yeah, hawks just on the trip. Too. How many hawks do you see dead? Probably none, because once you're. Not, yeah, I see one. I'm looking. Yeah, I have yeah. hawk vision, and Jane yeah. has hawk vision. Right. We drive down the road, and I'm like, "There's one. There's one." I see them all over the place, and people are like, "I don't see them," and I'm like, "Cause you, you just yeah, don't have your eyes them, yeah. trained. Yeah. My eyes are trained for it." Yeah. Now, now but one thing uh, to, to note as well is definitely, I think the parents um, pass it along to their young. Mm. Um, so with birds, when they're um, when they're feeding their young. Uh, they drool in their mouth, and that's what builds their immune system. Right. And oh. so they're drooling, 
you know, that saliva that is toxic so into their young. To Absolutely. The young. Yeah. And to watch Unknowingly. a bird come in with secondary rodenticides is heartbreaking. So, um, so they're bleeding out, they're hemorrhaging, and um, you, you have to stop the hemorrhaging. So you have to give them vitamin K shots every two hours, um, vitamin K shots every two hours in hopes of stopping the bleeding. If you don't stop the bleeding, then uh, what happens is they start having seizures and they die. Um, and it's just a, it's a very, very slow death. Um, it's like being poisoned with, uh, you know, like arsenic every day well, for cyanide. a period of time or cyanide. Yeah. Right. How, yes. many, how many cases have you had come in? Uh, I'd say uh, like half of my cases now that come in. So, um, you know, just this year, we've probably seen 50 birds with rodenticides. It's yeah. crazy. I don't know if you feel comfortable in it. Like, how many survive? Forty uh, percent, if I'm lucky. Okay. Yeah. Now, so mind you, these are the birds that are lucky enough to be seen right. by yes, somebody, right. uh, and where somebody actually does something, because generally people see it on the side of the road or they don't think anything, and they might think it actually gets hit by a car, but in fact, it's actually starving to death and it's dying from rodenticide poisoning. So this is probably fractional. So if if she sees fifty birds so far just this year, mm. that sounds like a lot, but what is actually being oh, it's evacuated like from the landscape? More, way more. Yeah. yeah. And this is, only, this is only right here. Jane and I grew up where we could live with rodents and we didn't die. Right. And right. now right. we're so intolerant of everything. We're like some ethereal creatures. Like everything in our life is all surrounded by steel and plastic and mm -hmm. rubber and nice shoes and nice everything and so we're intolerant to a mosquito we're intolerant to a bug we're intolerant to a rodent and uh, we just there's no give and take and as we become more intolerant all of these animals are being you know taken from the landscape and that's my big problem if it's not you know reptiles and amphibians it's raptors and it's insects we that you know reading statistically do you know, I was reading that maybe they think that we've taken maybe up to 80% of the bugs that occurred mm. in the 70s and the 80s. So it's declined that much where people actually would sell bug windshield wiper stuff because you had bugs on your windshield. No. You don't have that anymore. Right. And all the animals that depend on those bugs, all the songbirds, the bats, all the different stuff, they're the ones that suffer. It's good for us because we don't have to clean our windshields. But we're, we're so close-minded, and these are just all these incredible inconvenient truths that really like uh, hurt me because I'm I'm highly empathetic. And one thing we need to point about Jane, Jane is doing this out of her own pocket. She gets donations for you know the care and the upkeep of these animals, and there's a lot of money that goes into the veterinary bills and the veterinary needs. So all these birds that are coming in. Jane's uh, knowledge of veterinary uh, procedures is excellent. She's learned so much and she'll still have to rely on vets in many cases and that costs a lot of money. But one of the things that's very heartfelt here, Jane, every one of these birds that comes in there, she often has to witness their death. And she that takes a huge toll. And with the longevity of her being a rehabilitator, this is she's an unsung hero. She doesn't get a lot of credit for it. This is like a personal thing. But, uh, you know, for all the, the few birds that do survive compared to all the birds that are dying, it, it, it kills you. But at some point, like, it, it are, are you, do you yeah. constantly go, I don't want to do this anymore? Yes, yeah, it's, it's mentally exhausting. Um, when you see, like, it comes in waves, too. Um, so when, when birds are moving in or moving out is when I see big, big peaks of death and you know, when you see 20 deaths in a couple of days, it's exhausting. Yeah, that's... You know, it takes a toll on you. And, and so I, you know, I become a coward sometimes and I just like, I don't want to see this anymore. Right. I just don't want to do it anymore. I would, because I've talked to you and you're just... But if you give up, then I, then well, who will help them? Well, no, so... no, no, I'm, I'm not yeah. denying that. But the, the toll that it does cause yeah. on you, because I, I when I was a kid, I, I grew up, I wanted to be a vet. And I could not handle watching things right. die. I remember coming to a, a scene where a, a um, golden retriever had been hit by a car and I was on my bike 
and I had never seen so much blood in my life. And it was a four-way intersection, and the dog was right there, mm -hmm. and it didn't even seem real. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it like traumatized me. Yeah, it is traumatizing. I can. I've been on four accidents where I've seen dead people, and I'm not. I wasn't as traumatized by that. Right. I gotta turn my camera on, dude. You didn't turn your camera on!